Welcome to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Dr. Somer, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Would you like to introduce yourself to everyone out there listening? Well, I'm an Israeli clinical psychologist. I'm a scientist practitioner, meaning that I do therapy, but I also uh, do a lot of research. I was uh, affiliated with the University of Haifa until two years ago uh, when I stopped teaching, and now I do mainly research and, um, and, and psychotherapy. Uh, my main field of interest uh, has always been uh, associated with trauma and dissociative disorders. It's, uh, it's a little story on how I got to my adaptive daydreaming, but the, but, but the two issues are, are kind of related, the dissociation and, and, and excessive daydreaming are uh, connected in some way. So, you know, that's a, a brief introduction. Now, when it comes to maladaptive daydreaming, I've heard that it was linked somewhat with trauma, but is that just because they're trying to escape from reality and like the one that they build up during daydreaming, which I know, I, I think we need to change the word of daydreaming because I just feel like whenever you say it, people kind of don't take it seriously a little bit. It's kind of linked in, like I looked up, it comes in with mind wandering and a bunch of other things, but this seems unique to its own. Well, <clears throat> there is a confusion, uh, a kind of a fuzziness in, in the, in the uh, professional scientific literature concerning maladaptive daydreaming and, and, and mind wandering. They are used interchangeably, but the, I agree with you, they're not the same. So for the sake of um, you know, clarifying this, uh, let us say that mind wandering is um, what the brain, the mind does when it is off task, when it's not concentrating on doing something. Uh, and the mind is at rest and sort of wandering from one thought to the other. Most of the thoughts are <clears throat> usually uh, 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 related to mundane. Like getting groceries or check filling up the car with gas. Like this, planning your dinner or, or, or recalling, reminiscing something, going over a conversation you've had, or even preparing for a future conversation. <clears throat> That's mind wandering. <clears throat> uh, Daydreaming again, it's it, it involves uh, something that is much more fanciful, much more uh, uh, um, uh, fantasies involved in the storylines, and even that uh, mental activity lies on some kind of a continuum because people <clears throat> um, differ from one another in terms of the degree to which they can absorb themselves in their daydreaming. Um, I, for example, have a little capacity to, to become uh, completely absorbed and immersed in, in my fantasies. They don't have very strong uh, visual components to them. Um, but others <clears throat> on the other end of the continuum ha have hyperphantasia. They can experience uh, all sort of sensory <clears throat> components to their fantasy that to, 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 for some <clears throat> is experienced as if they are actually present. They have a sense of presence in the experience. That is something completely different. And we call this form of daydreaming <clears throat> immersive daydreaming. Immersive daydreaming in itself is not pathological. It's, not a, it's just a trait a capacity to uh, visualize the, the, the fantasy very vividly. And what people do when they discover this ability, usually it's, uh, we believe it's an innate ability, so it's discovered early on in childhood, that they can develop uh, complex storylines, complex scenarios. And this is where we get to, to the magic of it, because if you have a... Uh, this built-in virtual reality between your ears that you can then be the director, the scriptwriter, the director, um, you can actually create a, an idealized life um, and, 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 uh, and imagine things that uh, you would have liked to experience, that, that were fun and you want to re-experience, that you want to experience in a corrected way um, the, the sky's the limit and um, apparently 
I can imagine this only, I mean, not literally, but I can imagine how fun it, it can be. And so what do we have here? We have a, a, an ability to, uh, to actually be transported to an, to an inner world uh, that, is, uh, that we are in uh, complete control of. Uh, that, <clears throat> that can be extremely rewarding. And it can, and it, it would be doubly rewarding, of course, to those who experience uh, distress or have bad memories or have had, you know, live in difficult uh, life circumstances. They can simply transport themselves to the alternative reality. But you don't need to have trauma uh, to to have this trait because it's an innate trait, and you and um, you don't need to have trauma to get sort of addicted to this fun activity that is like a sort of a <clears throat> substance, but it's not toxic and it's legal and it's available. Um, you don't have to go anywhere. It's just right in your house. You just wherever you're at. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> so people who have this, some, some of people who have it just don't want to stop. They want to go back to, to the experience. Um, and that, so when does it become pathological? When does it become maladaptive? It's when it starts interfering with your daily responsibilities, when it impedes your, your functioning in some way, when, it, when you prefer to engage with your imaginary friend, friends instead of socializing or being with your family, when you prefer to imagine yourself excelling in whatever profession you want to be instead of studying or 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 practicing um the or or when you you do less work because it's just much more because work is dull and and in your fantasy you can do uh, unimaginable things uh so that's when it becomes a problem and when people lose so much time uh, in their fantasy and it uh, interferes and 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 and, and uh, compromises the quality of the functioning. Some of these individuals become depressed or anxious because they feel you know a loss of control and and that actually their life there's a big a growing gap between the idealized life they play out in their minds and 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 what's happening in reality. So we have another component of psychological distress and that's yeah the the pain the, the the depression the anxiety about lost opportunities so that's when we are getting concerned about it otherwise you know if, if people can daydream a few hours a day but still meet all their obligations and feel good then it's 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 an interesting mental activity but it's not a disorder I'm sure there's a probably a wide range of who might be susceptible for this type of daydreaming, but I'm, I'm just curious, have you been able to pick out like certain populations? I know we talk about early childhood and things of that sort, but is it more people with disorders? I would think with ADHD, if you're sitting in a school setting, which was a lot for me, I daydreamed all the time. It was very hard for me to focus, but that was my escape. But then you got to look at someone that might be have you know a child with like a single parent that might be working two jobs. So then they're at home all the time and maybe they like watching TV so much they get sucked up into it. And then that starts becoming part of their daydreaming experiences. And then OCD is a giant micromanager type thing. So I would think if you can create your own little separate reality and it goes exactly how you want it, it's way better than the actual reality. Then there's not really a point to kind of leave it in a sense. But I mean, I'm, like, have you been able to find a strong correlation with a certain population that there's like certain evidence that this is definitely something that could lead to this type of daydreaming? Yes, we have found some interesting correlations. Again, when you look at correlations, you must uh, uh, bring into consideration the fact that we, we cannot assume causality. Uh, there are just you know, two phenomena that go together, but we don't know what causes what. So, for example, if you take OCD, for example, uh, I, I believe that there is, in, in certain cases, um, a, an OCD factor, and we found it in, in research. That is, people 
uh, with this trait, with the ability for immersive daydreaming, they try to get it right, as it were, they get the fantasy right. So they repeat it over and over again, but they can't get it right. They can't get it right because of their OCD. Uh, but I don't know that this causes OCD or that OCD um, increases the likelihood for, uh, for immersive daydreaming. I don't think that is the case. But people who have the trait and also have OCD run the risk of just getting trapped in this fantasy because they, they just they want to perfect it all the time. Like a loop. <clears throat> so there is a correlation there. There's a very high correlation with ADHD. Uh, in fact, we found that uh, about 77% of people with the maladaptive daydreaming meet the diagnostic criteria for ADHD. And that would make sense because um, you can't really concentrate if you have these in intrusive fantasies uh, and, and if, if you're drawn to your fantasy world all the time, that comes at the expense of paying attention to the external world, obviously. So th there's a strong correlation with ADHD, but with the inattentive type, because there's also the uh, hyperactivity element in ADHD. So it's not correlated with that, but it's correlated with inattention. Uh, but that, that immensely high correlation uh, led us to uh, consider that maybe we're talking about the same, the same, um, disorder so we so we went ahead and 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 studied a group of people that were diagnosed with adhd and in that group we found out that maladaptive the only about 20 percent 22 percent had maladaptive daydream so it's not the same disorder but there's probably a subtype of adhd that is caused not by the uh, a, a neuropsychological uh, abnormality that perhaps have happened in the brain and, and, and uh, interfere with attention. But there's a subgroup of people with ADHD that, that their inattention is probably better explained by their very active fantasy life that draws their attention resources inwardly. And that, that, that creates uh, inattention to the external world. So there's a correlation there, and there perhaps we have some idea about causality. How does uh, excessive daydreaming cause inattention? We know it's not; it's probably not the other way around. Um, so there's a correlation there. We also, um, another clinical group that we looked at are people with, um, who are on the autistic uh, spectrum. Uh, and uh, uh, the, 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 this these this group of individuals are known to to engage in in um, in daydreaming. It's it's one of their their characteristics, um, and uh, indeed we found a, a positive significant correlation there. Uh, but uh, we still need to study this more. Because obviously, it doesn't mean that people who have maladaptive daydreaming. Um, uh, are, uh, have autistic features. We, uh, we don't imply that, but uh, clearly people with autism who have difficulties understanding the external world, who have difficulties understanding people and how they interact and feel discomfort, sometimes feel overwhelmed by social interactions, uh, feel much safer in, in their inner worlds that they create. Yeah, sometimes too much input. Exactly. So, so in their fantasies, they can control that. They can really regulate the, the amount of input, the, the intensity of socializing that they fantasize. Um, but that is a, still an open field for investigation because we still don't know exactly what characterizes the themes, the fantasy themes of people with um, autism. So, um, so I agree with you. It's, it, it seems that this form of fantasizing is, cuts across several diagnostic groups. Uh, so it's a trait. It's a trait that can come together with, with other, other psychological uh, phenomena and, and conditions. And um, 
it's a trait that can offer the stress regulation. Um, so it's extremely, uh, potentially extremely appealing to those who are suffering. So if they have this trait, they can turn it on and decrease their pain, their emotional pain, because they go elsewhere or they can soothe themselves better. So, you know, you have, you have a, it's kind of a talent um, that if used um, in, uh, pro in, in, in proportion uh, can be very helpful because it's also conducive to creativity. Yeah. Is now, is it, is, I, don't, I don't know how to really necessarily phrase this question, but could it be the similar things like with someone going, coping through a loss, like for instance, memory, when it comes to remembering a memory and living inside of that memory? Because every time you go back to a memory, you sometimes change it a little bit. And I'm curious because there are sometimes you take a memory that might, Think you you think it went this way, but it didn't go that way. It actually went a different way. And I would feel like if you keep trying to relive in that memory and keep trying to look at things, like I know I think everybody wakes up in the middle of the night and thinks about, oh my God, that time in middle school. It's like, why am I worried about that? I'm like 30 years old. It doesn't matter. But you change it and kind of sometimes you can either ramp it up and make it worse in your head, or you can try and find a way to be able to kind of cope with it or just, you know, so it's not so much of a stinging memory. I'm curious if someone's ever tried or looked at any data that shows that someone tried to create a daydream from a memory or an existence of memory. I, I think about it sometimes I have like childhood moments or something like that. And then I try and do like, do like a fly on the wall in that memory and you start exploring and then creating details and necessarily aren't a part of that memory. But then if I go and try and remember what that memory is, I have now altered it a little bit where I have to kind of find like, wait a minute, I created this part to it. The only part that I actually remember is this. I'm not trying to sound insane. I'm just saying like, you're do I'm doing six hours of cardio and I'm doing this half the time. So you're trying to do anything to make sure you're not paying attention to that. Right, right. Well, you, you are touching upon a very sensitive issue that has been uh, at the center of perhaps the biggest controversy in psychology in, in the last hundred years or so. And that is the question of uh, true versus false memories. Uh, the issue, this controversy uh, revolved mainly around recovered memories of, of abuse. It was a center of very big legal debates uh, when the defense attorneys uh, of, of people accused of child abuse were questioning uh, recovered memories of, of, the, of their victims, of, of the survivors, claiming that memory is pliable, is, uh, is not something that you can rely on. And if people think too much about uh, an event, even an imagined event, they can mistake it for reality. Uh, this type of, um, of defense, of course, uh, caused a lot of concern and harm to many victims and, uh, and their advocates, and they're like the, the clinical psychologists who were treating them. So that, uh, first I would say that I accept and agree that uh, uh, re uh, retrieving a memory is not like playing a um, a video file. You know, you you don't you don't retrieve the things as they were recorded because uh, people construct and reconstruct their memories. And with immersive and maladaptive dating, we have a special challenge here that is associated with the question of. What, as you said, what is the source of what I remember? You know, what I, I remember something clearly, but is the source the event or is the source the vivid, absorptive uh, uh, fantasy that I can create? And sometimes people have a hard time differentiating between the two, especially if they fantasize about real people and plausible events. Because if you fantasize about, you know, Harry Potter environment, you know that you haven't been there or, you know, Star Wars or stuff like that. But, but, it, but if it's about your own family or friends that you'd, you'd like to sort of idealize certain interactions, uh, then it's, it's difficult to tell. So uh, I, we are actually investigating this as, as we speak, thus one or two studies that we're running uh, just to shed light on, on exactly this, this kind of issue. Um, 
I had one clinical example, clinical uh, case in which um, there was evidence that the memory was false and associated with fantasy. You know, to, to, to be able to claim that the memory is false, you need to have evidence that refutes the memory. That's not easy. Um, so in, in one case that, that I had, and I, had, I got permission from this person to, to write the case up, so I don't have, I, I'm not uh, uh, infringing on her confidentiality when I talk about it. Um, uh, she, was, uh, she was visually, and she still is visually impaired. Um, and isolated uh, socially, uh, be, uh, partly because of their visual, her visual impairment. And this, this uh, person reported about three very dramatic events that happened to her that had to do with, with her anxiety. For example, during COVID, she all of a sudden uh, you know, called up her, 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 her family uh, asking for help, telling them that she got COVID and that she is um, she li she lives independently and that she's uh, hospitalized, that she's in intensive care, and she has a hard time breathing. And her family, of course, alarmed. Uh, she hung up, you know, and, and called all, all the uh, emergency departments. Eventually, uh, found out that she's at home actually and was completely immersed in an anxiety-ridden fantasy that she might contract COVID and she, she fantasized that she actually got it. And it was so believable that uh, she confused reality with fantasy. Now, this, that, she had three such incidents and this uh, is not actually about a memory, but it, it's even more dramatic because it's something very current. This person is not psychotic. She is- uh, Well, it's a plausible scenario. And um, yeah, but 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 it illustrates the at least possibility that somewhat someone under certain circumstances might confuse reality with fantasy. In her case, uh, visual stimulation is very limited, so the only imageries images that are real for her come from her fantasies. So, uh, so that's one explanation why she mistook these memories for reality because her fantasy sometimes is more real than what she uh, perceives uh, when she's awake and, and, uh, and, and uh, focused externally. So th this is possible. But uh, from the preliminary data that we have uh, derived from interviewing people with uh, uh, maladaptive daydreaming, it seems that going back to the controversy of false, uh, false memories of abuse, that people who are, people want to want to improve their mental state and are motivated to feel good and not to create distress. So people are unlikely to conjure and to come up with uh, horrible uh, fantasies about that are false about their past. In fact, the opposite is is more likely that people who have uh, uh, have had um, adverse childhood circumstances would tend to fantasize about ideal families, or or distract themselves and have you know fantasies, Disney World type fantasies, in order to regulate their distress. So. Uh, my initial, these are sort of initial impressions from the data we, the, that we collected. Uh, this is a study that is still going on and being analyzed and written up. Is that uh, people with uh, maladaptive dating would not tend to, uh, to, to have false memories of abuse, but they might be uh, more likely to err in attributing some uh, other more plausible events uh, to reality while it was they were uh, they were fantasized. Um, but again, you you touched upon a, a hot topic in in our field.
whoops i mean that's most of my life i end up stepping in something i didn't know was a controversy but um <laughs> when it comes to virtual simulators or you know these vr games that we have out now is that another like could that be masking a lot of things that could be like this form of daydreaming as well too because you technically are stepping into your own reality if you've ever seen um sims 4 or sims any of the sim series it's about creating a life having a family you can do whatever you want in that game it's basically about being an adult which is a great escape for a kid because that's all most kids ever talk about is talking about wanting to be an adult or wanting to you know go out into the world on their own so they don't have any parents that are telling them what to do and i have to think that if you have a child that's pressured either to get a job a good most parents you know when my generation was about getting a job being president or an astronaut or something like that you know try and make sure you don't ever have to struggle and then i'm just thinking well how much pressure does that apply on the kid and then when that kid like you know, get sucked into video games, most of my friends played Sims or some type of game where they created their reality to the point where they wouldn't hang out with other friends because they liked playing Sims. I'm at fault for doing it at times, too. It's fun, but it's also a video game. So it's like, could that be the similar things, much like, you know, maladaptive daydreaming is not an intensity where you're actually experiencing it. And I understand that there's different intensities. I think mine are pretty intense, but I've heard some stories from some people. But Sims is a great quick thing where you don't need a lot of creativity and it doesn't seem like it's daydreaming because you're playing a game but essentially you're thinking about what you're going to do next and you're kind of developing what the story is going to be should i do this is that going to lead to this or this or this or should i do this and that's going to lead to this and this and this what happens if my sim's an astronaut and then you're putting yourself visualizing yourself in that position so i'm curious if you have any data that shows that video games can be masking some types of diagnoses or diagnoses of you know maladaptive daydreaming or a form of daydreaming or is that might be creating it i mean it's not a trauma experience but it is an experience that can introduce someone to the subject of now all you're thinking to, now all you're thinking about is your video game and living in that digital world that you created you could be at work thinking about it because you like that video game so much right Right. Well, uh, the, I see one uh, very clear similarity between uh, uh, this experience in maladaptive daydreaming or immersive daydreaming, and that is the escape, escapism. And that is the, the motivation here is quite similar to, um, to be in a different reality that is distracting, that is immersive, that is engulfing you. Uh, and sometimes acting through avatar, so not being you, being being someone else, creating protagonists and images that 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 you are their master and their uh, their you know the director, and um, so there is a great similarity there in in terms of function. Of, so so this is also a an activity that can lead to. Uh, to addiction in a sense that people want more and more of it. Uh, and when that comes at the expense of, of achieving and promoting your own goals in life, that can become a problem. Uh, the other similarity is, of course, the escape to fantasy. Uh, what, these, uh, what, what differentiates between the two is simply the ability to do it in your mind. Uh, uh, that is characteristic of people with immersive and maladaptive daydreaming uh, in these uh, computer games uh, the visualization is in front of you is is given to you still you need i guess there's a lot of room for creativity and you can get immersed in this world that you create so these is usually also these are multiplayer activities so you so so you interact with others whom actually you don't know uh you don't need to know and the all the avatars are, are fictional so this too is about uh, the motivation to to create an alternate reality and escape from the current reality and the question of course is why why do that what is the motivation of people to uh uh, prefer living in, in, in an alternate world rather than in this world. And this reminds me of, of another phenomenon that we recently reported in the scientific literature. It's called reality shifting. It's also an, a, 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 a new trend uh, that spiked uh, when COVID was announced as a, as a, um, as a, a 
as a, a ser, as a threat, as a health threat by the World Health Organization. So around that time, we see a spike in in uh, Google search were uh, searches for the term um, uh, shifting or reality shifting, and what that involves is um, gener Generation Z uh, people. Uh, trying to induce themselves into what they believe is a parallel world. Um, some of them will go as far as believing that this sort of is a quantum phenomena in which they actually can jump into a, a parallel world. But the idea is here is that they are trying to induce themselves. So the practices that they are describing online of getting into uh, this reality shifting experience reminds some of uh, some of us scholars of consciousness of an hypnotic inductions so they try to concentrate relax and um, use uh, self affirmations and uh, and um, sort of uh, hypnotically inductive uh, uh, words and techniques in order to shift the reality and there is uh, we, when we study this um, uh, the chatter uh, in, in these um, uh, communities, we realize that some people can't do it because apparently they're not endowed with hypnotic, self-hypnotic abilities. Uh, so there are leaders uh, there who promote this and teach, teach others how to do it. And many are capable of doing it to various degrees of su success and satisfaction. And others are frustrated that they can, because they can't get there to their altar. But again, this is another uh, modern age phenomena that is associated with the motivation to escape um, something that has always characterized, I, I guess, youth who wanted to experiment with uh, with altered state of consciousness or rebel and 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 be and explore uh, experiences uh, <clears throat> and now within the age of the internet people can easily teach each other talk to each other about these uh, experiences and how to uh, to get them uh, so these are different forms of a similar motivation not to be here to to and to shape and alter uh, the the experience and when we talk about experience that actually means consciousness not to be here but to be elsewhere without substances that is a sort of a self-hypnotic consciousness altering experience that to me is very interesting now are you seeing like a certain generations that are experiencing it more like is it becoming more frequent I know like uh, it's not accepted into the DSM criteria, which is a shame. I'd like to raise awareness on that, but there's a, my generation, I mean, everyone has regrets. Everyone has something that they would like to go back in time and fix, whether it's wanting to ask out a girl, I would think if you had social anxiety, you would try and think of the best way possible that you could do it and run multiple scenarios in your head. But we don't look at that as like, we don't look at that as daydreaming. We don't look at that as anything. We just kind of look at it like, oh, you're just anxious. And then we kind of gloss it all, like gloss it off to the side. So I wonder if we, raise awareness on it, get it recognized, and more things that people would be like, oh, you're just a kid and grow out of it. Same thing like it was for me with ADHD. Once it starts becoming recognized, you're going to have things that maybe even better treatments to be able to help people that get stuck in these experiences as well too. I mean, raising your mental well-being is not insane thinking. I think everyone has regrets and everyone has depression and things where that cause them to escape from reality because life is tough. But it's about when it becomes so impactful to where you can't experience life anymore. And now this alternate reality is where you always want to go, which becomes a problem. I think it's healthy to go there sometimes. I enjoy it. But it's also knowing that there's a distinctive line between fantasy and then the reality part to it. So I think it can be taught in a beneficial way. But if we don't educate on it, if we don't talk about it, then how are people going to know what they're experiencing? And then they get stuck in that loop. They get stuck in that pit and they can't really get out well what, what, what is of concern is that you know i hear reports people write me i see the chatter online of you know uh, of, of in, people uh, uh struggling with with this uh, excessive fantasy disorder and they 
reach out for help and then of course since it's not in the any of the main psychiatric manuals it's not in the dsm it's not in the icd um it's simply um un unrecognized and um and often uh mental health professionals will diagnose the other concomitant uh, comorbid disorders because and adaptive daydreaming, as we know, we started our conversation, uh, uh, is associated with other problems. So, uh, so people who, who come to get help and they get diagnosed for something else, not for this mental addi addiction, that is that is of concern. Uh, some, of course, also as you uh, uh, as you suggested, uh, uh, get uh, a, a reaction of dismissal. It's nothing. Everybody daydreams. You just get over it and uh, don't worry about it. And that, of course, is um, an unempathic, uh, it would be an unempathic reaction because uh, the patient has come to you for help because they are unhappy about it, they are concerned about it, they suffer. So this, to, to dismiss it as 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 nothing is uh, just um, you know an in, in, injustice. I, I can't blame the the therapist because it's not. I mean, it's not in the manuals. They're not trained to diagnose it. So that is a challenge. This is our challenge, and, and perhaps yours as a um, as a host of a of of a, of a internet talk show to to promote awareness. Your this this is why I was happy to accept your invitation to be your guest because it's another opportunity to uh, promote awareness of, of this form of uh, excessive daydreaming. And um, our impression is that, uh, you know, science speaks, you know, the data speak, and we have uh, accumulated now by now dozens of good quality, sound, rigorous uh, research studies that uh, uh, prove that uh, maladaptive daydreaming is a reliable, distinct mental disorders that cannot be better explained by any of the existing disorders. It's unique and therefore uh, deserves uh, a, a unique treatment. And we have some good news regarding treatment because we just um, published a, a study it was led by uh, my doctoral student and now Dr. Uh, Oren uh, Hersku, uh, who conducted a randomized clinical trial um, offering individuals, uh, those who were on the re research arm or the experimental arm, not the control arm, um, um, some, some specific skills such as uh, increasing their motivation to change it because it's an addiction so and highly rewarding. So you need to be highly motivated to remind yourself of the cost of not changing it and the benefits of, of, of controlling this better, uh, offering them, the, them uh, te simple techniques for self-monitoring because people are sometimes just not aware of how much time they spend in their fantasy world. And offering them a, uh, a, a technique that will help them um, be present. It's called mindfulness. It's now a very popular therapeutic uh, technique that is applied in many other disorders. Mindfulness training, that is, and people need to learn to do it because, as you said, from your own personal experience, you can you don't notice uh, how much time goes by and how quickly time flies when you are daydreaming. You can be engaged in rigorous exercise for hours when you do that. So that is just an an illustration of of how uh, unaware sometimes people can be of the of the amount of time, and that that. Uh, uh, aids them in dismissing the gravity of, of the situation. So when they monitor uh, the amount of time that they spend in daydreaming, they, they, can, they can also understand the patterns. So uh, th this intervention, this three-arm intervention, um, is extremely uh, uh, promising because uh, uh, after only eight sessions, online sessions, there was 
uh, patient-driven. So we, we, the, no therapist was involved. They, they, they were exposed to lessons, instructions, videos. They received homework, need to report it, but it was all without the therapist touching. After only eight sessions, we had significant improvements. Some of them were not, uh, did not meet the diag suggested diagnostic criteria from an adaptive dating at the end and at a six month follow-up. So we, we followed it up to see if, if these are durable uh, changes. Uh, so there is hope and obviously, we talked about this as self-medication, as some as a, as a as a behavior that is designed to regulate distress. So obviously, undoubtedly, a, a, a comprehensive, thorough therapy for maladaptive daydreaming needs to address not only the addiction but also the cause for the addiction, if there is a cause: uh, social anxiety, uh, sadness, depression, uh, whatever. Um, not there's not always an underlying cause, but uh, often there is. Uh, the, uh, it, it explains, you know, why people prefer not to be present, but elsewhere. Um, so uh, a combination of a, uh, a technique that helps people control better the the urge, the yearning to escape, with dealing with the underlying issues, to my mind, uh, offers can offer great hope and, and help for people uh, who are struggling with this disorder. So there's, there's good news there too. And of course, the fact that there is therapy for it also um, adds to the validity of, and, uh, of, of, of this construct and makes it a good candidate to be included in one of the future editions of the DSM, for example. Do you find newer researchers that are open to the idea of maladaptive daydreaming? Like if I was a client and I walked in and said, can you look up maladaptive daydreaming? I think I have it. Are they going to actually take the time to do so? I find that with younger researchers or younger health professionals that they're more open to an idea like that before. And I'm wondering if this type of daydreaming is actually getting recognized to the point where you're having people that go, you know, I've heard of that. I'm going to look it up and see what we can possibly do. Because I feel like a lot of times it's they always look for something that's more like a basic one, one that would be more diagnosed, like ADHD or something like that, that, which is now getting recognized. But then there's other things like maybe you have depression or maybe you have anxiety. I have so many friends that are on anxiety and depression pills where I'm like, is that 100 percent what you what you have or is they just tell you that and then you kind of take it? I'm not saying anything at the professionals, but there is obviously a patient workload that happens over to doctors and they're trying to figure out how to help you with the time that they have as well, too. And I start going, do we have anybody who's open to new ideas? Is that a new field, a new generation that's coming into the medical system or healthcare system that's looking at, OK, you know, I've heard that. And I would think with the Internet, there's probably a lot of things that are able to pop up that can show you it doesn't mean you have to take it as health advice i'm not saying that i'm just saying there's so many ideas now where if you just google it you're going to find something about it and i guarantee you there's probably a community of people much like with this subject that are talking about it where it's like okay it is a real thing it's just not recognized i'm telling you i'm I, there's a subreddit uh I, I guess most of our, many of our listeners know what reddit is so it has a subgroup dedicated to maladaptive daydreaming, I think it has over 90,000 members in this community. And that's just one community. There's a great need for, uh, for uh, people struggling with it to, to discuss, to talk, to get uh, peer support because professionals don't recognize it enough. Um, I would say it's a process. Look, the term was coined in 2002. It was the first time it was mentioned in the literature. So it's a very young and emerging disorder. So if you would Google it in 2002, you would find zero results. Now you get something like 300,000 hits. Uh, so people talk about it, it's mentioned, uh, it's discussed. And uh, best of all, there are a few dozen good research papers out there. So what I would suggest to people who watch your show and um, are, are concerned that they or a loved one has maladaptive daydreaming is to Google three words, maladaptive research, maladaptive daydreaming research, that's three words. And on the first page, probably the first hit on the first page would be our uh, research website. 
And on our research website, go to the publication tab. And that's it, and show it to your doctor. The publication tab has all the research studies, papers, and they are accessible, they're downloadable. Um, so that's the, you know, if, if your doctor is, is not too concerned about, uh, or let me put it differently, if, if your doctor is open to learn and, and to learn from you and to admit that, that there's something that he or he don't know, then you're on a good track. Um, most doctors would, would be interested because um, it's, uh, it, it's not good practice to ignore science. So uh, maladaptive daydreaming research, Google it. That's, wh that's where your resources are on our, uh, it's called the International Consortium for Maladaptive Daydreaming uh, uh, Research. It's a group of uh, researchers who promote this, collaborate, and our, our publications are there for the public uh, to read. Can I ask what your biggest challenge is so far with just this type of research? Well, there are two challenges. Uh, uh, the first one, we know this starts in childhood. We would like to be able to identify this er as early as possible uh, because we get a lot of, of emails and calls from parents who say, look, I, I, my child is doing this. They, they are walking about, they're talking to themselves. They seem lost in their own world for hours. And they talk about, you know, their, their imaginary friends, but, you know, they'd rather do that than do their homework. And they look, because they're children, they're not self-conscious, so they look odd to others. Um, and there's nothing to offer them. And these children uh, grow up to be adults. And, and for those who develop maladaptive daydreaming, that's, you know, uh, a shame because it, uh, years of, of, of embarrassment and suffering and, and, this function could have been avoided if this were to be detected earlier. So the biggest challenge right now is to do research with children. This is of course always complex because you need to have the cooperation of the parents and the parental consent. And, but that's one direction that we are working hard to promote, early identification and early intervention. And the other, is related to the, I would say, the gold standard of, of mental health research is to find the ob objective evidence that this form of daydreaming is unique. And that could be done by studying uh, electrical activities of the brain or doing brain imaging studies while people are daydreaming under the scanners, while in the scanners, in the brain scanners, and to compare them to how the brain functions when they are uh, instructed to pay attention to external uh, uh, stimuli, and compare them to people who are not endowed with this trait. Uh, you know, once you once you present the scientific world with hard objective data, not self-report, that is the gold standard for really establishing the validity of a disorder. Uh, so we're looking for um, research partners who are have access to these very expensive brain scanning machines or who would be interested to collaborate with us. We're not there yet. Do you find that it's just because there's not a cemented name that's funding some of these studies? Like you have a lot of people that are independently researching it and having papers published, but what about like if you had like a concrete well-known name that solidified it? I mean, your name is respected. I'm not saying that. I mean, like an institution that was like, this is a 100% study. I feel like more people would look into it because of that. I mean, you could have a bunch of papers published, but if I don't know if people are reading the names or certain individuals are looking at the name and they're just looking for something that they know to be like, well, they signed off on it. Then that's kind of the end that you it's guys always have. Good to, it's always good to have a, a renowned scientist involved, but ultimately what, what talks are the data, the results. So you can... You know, I would be happy to conduct such a brain scanning study with a junior researcher. If the, if the results would be good, it'll be accepted to talk to, to, to good journals. 
Um, but these are expensive studies, and you know, just to run some to to run somebody under such a such a scanner, uh, it costs a lot of money. Um, and uh, uh, our our young and emerging field is uh, just get, getting funded. A colleague of mine in Israel uh, received a nice, handsome grant uh, to do it, but she's not. She she will not focus on on brain imaging. But uh, once we get funded by uh, by by the establishment, uh, we'll be able to promote it. A shortcut, as I said, would be to have a, a scientist who is a neurologist who has access to these machines and who is interested. Maybe somebody who struggles who struggles with immersive daydreaming. <laughs> that would be a good candidate. Do you know? I feel like well, that's how people end up educating themselves on it is when they realize what they're experiencing. It is um, either that, or if you have like a a parent, usually if a, they have a kid that suffers with it or has it, and they heard about it, they'll start doing a lot of research, and it has to affect you for someone to actually want to go and search into it. Um, but would you know why movement somehow amplifies the daydream uh, experience that they have? Well, that's a paper that just uh, of mine that just got uh, accepted for publication. <laughs> so, uh, so yes, I have some idea about that. Um, so, as as you imply, uh, maladaptive daydreaming and immersive daydreaming, the non pathological uh, uh, variant of this, involves two very distinct behaviors. One of them is the exposure to music. Music is very important to many people with this. Uh, it sort of sets, it's like the soundtrack of a movie. So it sets the mood, it, it act, sort of activates the body. It, uh, it's very important to, not to all, but to many. And movement is extremely important to, to most, not all, but to most people with maladaptive daydreaming. In, in, in fact, one, one collaboration that we're developing as we speak is with child neurologists who treat uh, children with what they call stereotypical movement disorder. They have discovered that many of the children who meet the diagnostic criteria for stereotypic movement disorder actually report that they fantasize. They daydream while they're doing it, and it's a lot of fun. So somehow we read each other literature, we started talking, and now we are convinced that we're actually the childhood antecedents of maladaptive daydreaming were right there in plain sight. They just called it stereotypical movement disorder. We are, we are confident that it's the same thing. And now we are launching a study of children with stereotypical movement disorder who have this stereotype, stere, stereotypical um, behaviors of rocking, pacing, uh, twirling, uh, some, uh, an object in their hand, mouthing. Uh, uh, and we're going to follow them up uh, to adulthood. It's also possible to have someone who was diagnosed in childhood and they are now a, a few years ago and to catch them as adults and see if they meet the diagnostic criteria of maladaptive daydreaming. So um, I don't know, I don't remember what your question was, but I, but I got excited about it because that's exactly what we're doing now. Uh, so I, I don't know if I answered your question. You did. It was just about movements and why the intensity increases. Oh, up. movements, yeah. movements, right. So, okay. So one function of the movement is um, to enhance concentration. No, I didn't answer your question. Now I'm answering it. One function of movement is, is, is to enhance con concentration. So people sort of rock back and forth. And it sort of, uh, it sort of helps, them, helps them deepen their fantasy. That's one type of movement. And another category of movement is our movements that are embodiments of the fantasy. So they would, they would throw punches in the air, they would gesture, they would uh, grimace, they would uh, mouth their, and that would be an actual a um, physical manifestation of the fantasy that they are playing in their mind. So these are two types of movement. But you hit it right on the the nail right on the head. It's extremely it's it's highly characteristic 
of, uh, of maladaptive daydreaming. And of course, to the unsuspecting eye, people who do this might look odd to the onlookers. So that's why people with uh, maladaptive daydreaming prefer to normalize their movement by exercising, jogging, uh, power walking, or they seek solitude. They just don't want to be observed. Now, when I found the research about that, or when I saw that, that one of the, there was movements of a repetitive manner, I thought back to this kid in my class who had autism, and he would always rock back and forth in his chair. Right. And no one, everyone would kind of wonder why, but now it kind of makes sense if he's living in his own little daydream thing. I would have to think that anything that brings you out to an escape, and maybe that's why some of it gets linked in with the autism stuff as well, too, is because it's like a repetitive manner as well, too. I mean, ADHD, I know they say it's not on the spectrum and stuff, and I have it. I don't want to say that I'm autistic at all, but when you start looking at like some similarities with it, you start going, okay, there's a few things here where it's like the impulsivity, you know, there's a lot of social masking to make sure you're not showing a piece of yourself or anything that could be, I wouldn't say society accepted. Um, when it comes to the manner that you're supposed to be acting, you know what to act like in public compared to what you can act like in private. Everyone has that, but I feel like with ADHD, you have to censor a little bit more. So I think normalization is really important because like Talking about this type of stuff, the way it can be described as well, too, can kind of sound nuts if it's just a single experience, but that's just because we haven't been educated on it as a public. Once you start realizing there's a whole community of people that probably have similar experiences, it, I mean, it normalizes it, and which is the, probably the, one of the most important things that we can honestly do just so we can actually talk about it, educate on it, and then people will be more receptive to it. I agree. Well, Mr. Summer, I appreciate the time you gave me to talk on my show, but is there a place where people can find any papers that you have published or any links that you would like to provide? Oh, as I said, it's all out there, available and downloadable. Um, uh, just Google Maladaptive Daydreaming Research, and you'll find our website, uh, International Consortium for Maladaptive Daydreaming Research. And... If you want to ask me a question, I hope I, I, I won't, I'm not shooting myself in the foot. You can Google Ellie Sommer, find me. And if the question is short, I, I might uh, I, I in all likelihood answer you. Okay. And I'm going to link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. And thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. And stay tuned for our next episode.